Welcome to the 14th episode of the ongoing series, The Ten Lost Tribes in Jewish Consciousness, here on Sfarim Chatter. I'm Nachi Weinstein. This episode of the series discusses a fascinating and less well-known part of the Ten Lost Tribes story, which is the Jews of China and the sad tale of one Rabbi Uziel Haga of Boston, uh, his travels to China in, in search of the Lost Tribes and his ultimate untimely demise there in China at the time of the Boxer Rebellion at the turn of the 20th century. So there's some Chinese history here history of the Jews of China Lost Tribes, a really interesting and a bit different episode. The corporate sponsor of this series is, as always, Gluck Plumbing. For all your service needs, big or small in New Jersey, with a full service division from boiler replacements, main sewer line snakeouts, carrying main lines to a simple faucet leak, Gluck Plumbing Service Division has you covered. Give them a call, 732-523-1836, extension 1, and please tell them you heard them on the podcast. To sponsor an individual episode of this series or an episode on the podcast, please email me at farmchatter at gmail.com or see the links and information in the show's notes below. Additionally, in the links in the show's notes, you can check out links to the Farm Chatter WhatsApp community where I post new books, Sfarim, book deals, and, and the like, as well as the Farm Chatter Substack and YouTube. And wherever you listen to uh, the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And with that, enjoy the episode. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Welcome to another edition of the Svarim Chatter podcast and another episode in the series here on Svarim Chatter, The Ten Lost Tribes in Jewish Consciousness. And on this episode of the podcast and the series, I'm going to be joined once again by Professor Tzvi Bendor Benit, who is professor in the Department of History and the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University, NYU, and who we had a pretty lengthy two and a half hour episode earlier in this series and an overview based on his book, The Ten Lost Tribes of World History. On this episode, we're going to be discussing something that really goes to his, his main expertise, which is Chinese history, and really comes in here in the Lost Tribe series. It's something that's discussed briefly in that book, that first book, which is the curious case of Rabbi Uziel Haga and his trip to, he was a rabbi in Boston, and his trip to China and uh, with the, looking for the Lost uh, Tribes. So, the book that he prints, and we'll get to this shortly, there's two of them. One is called Sefer Habris Chadash, the one that I'm holding here. This is the, the uh, newer, quote unquote, 1911, Piatrakov. And the earlier one was Mitzios Aseras Ashvatim, and we'll talk about that. But just to read, I'm going to read the opening paragraph, and then I'll turn it over to Professor Benit to talk about because there's a lot here. It says, Sefer Habris Chadash, Im Hanohar Asambatian B'Medinas China, which is spelled Chayna, Ches Yud Nun Aleph. It says, The Sefer is in this book, Yisaper, it's told over Tir Echad, a trip Asher Nosa Im Chayel Tzvoz America with the American army, Birishoyan with the permission Hanosi McKinley, President William McKinley, Losser as Sfune Tmune Mamleches Hasinin, so he's going to go to in the China, to China, Beis Melchemes Hamolochem Hayeropim, the war of the Europeans, Bishnas Hey Aleph Tofresh Samach Aleph Pechaina, so this is between 1899 and 1901. Yitor Bisrad Nemon told us, I'm Sheikh of Peruza. He's going to tell you, Minhageyem, their customs, Talukhaseyem, their goings, Doseyem, their laws, Taxisei Melchamsom, Chulu, Chulu, Chulu. The Yofits are Bohir al Yehudim and Imsoim Sham to shed some light on the Jews living there. The Yechiach bin Moifsim Chaischim to show you with proofs came Setsoi, Aserz Ashvatim, they are descendants of the Ten Lost Tribes, Asher Hoglam Hamelech Asher, Lilach Lechavar, that were exiled by the Assyrian Empire. Biyarich Loshin Shal Zahuris Bidover Hanor Sambati and talk about the Sabatian River. Bat Sotsa Yeshara Lis Achid in my Yehudim Ul Hosra Mesach Hamavdu Benem of Benenu. Talk about the you know the separation between us. But the Elis Rabois Titzmachana Mizel Hara Hamas Kar in Israel. Bashe Matira who? Uziel Hagami Boston. That's the name of the uh, person who went. And in small type, on bottom of this it says, Asher Shavu, that who was captured, Hachainim, the Chinim, Habaxarim, the boxers. Biyomos, Bekale Akare Savlo Yusurim Koshim Umachovim Noiroim Vegam Kavura Le Haisaloi. And it says here, and he died after having many he was afflicted with uh, you know a variety of different things. Uh, and he was he doesn't even have burial, and it was printed. Um it says Bahitos base met Nishar Svarum Shabizhok Shlamovitz Belodsh. 
It was printed in Europe. So there's a lot there in the title page, as you heard. I yeah. didn't read too fast. And I'll turn it over to Professor Benit. So what's going on? What is this story? Who are the boxers? Who is China? Who's Rabbi Ozil Haga? What's he doing with President McKinley? What is going on in this story? Exactly. Yeah, what is going on? Let's begin, actually, with a quick um, interpretation of one thing that he says here. And I don't have the beautiful Ashkenazic Hebrew that you have. But he says... In the one of the final sentences in that paragraph, and by the way, we should say to everybody that the book is available to download for free at hebrewbooks.org. Okay, um, so you can all uh, go there and, and 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 read the book. It's not very uh, it's uh, not very uh, big, uh, and it, it, the interesting thing is that there's a lot of Yiddish there, uh, which I'm going to make uh, some comments about it because I struggled with it at the time. But what he says here is something about Nahar Sabbatyon. He says, Ya'arich lashon shel zehorit. Now, which translates Ya'arich where he's going to speak at length about something about which he de- describes as lashon shel zehorit. And I did not, I was unable to, to translate the term lashon shel zehorit, what he, what he was meaning by that. And after many years, I concluded that lashon shel zehorit, of course, is what you put, is a, is a is a ptil of 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 wool that is red that you put it on the on the horns of the uh, um, of the sair azazel in Yom Kippur and it becomes white. Yes. So I'm thinking that what he tries to mean by that that he's going to clarify a lot of things for us the way lashon shel zehorit is red and then it becomes white. Okay. So he's doing that. I'm actually asking the Talmidei Chachamim who are listening to us if this is a correct interpretation of this term because I've never u- never saw the term Lashon Shezorit is like used outside the, the context of Yom Kippur. So um, this book, as we just heard, was uh, published first uh, in 1905 in, uh, in Petrkov and then in 1911. Um, pretty much the same... Uh, the same, uh, 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 the same uh, book. Apparently, they they, ch- they changed the title between 1905 to 1911. But what it should prove to us that there was a readership for that book. Okay, and later on, maybe we can say something about what category of this book that you know people were reading it. It was written by someone who we don't know anything about. We know about this man two things. Basically, that he was Oziel. His name was Oziel Haga. Okay, and he was in Boston, from Boston. I suspect that this man was probably born in Europe and migrated because he speaks pre-modern Hebrew of someone who went through the yeshiva world in Eastern Europe. He's, um, he's uh, speaking, um, he's using a lot of Talmudic uh, uh, terms. And, and let me give you one that like, is a very, very nice proof when you read this book. Because whenever he talks about the different types of people in China, he says that they are green, Yerukim, right? However, it's not that in China we have green people. What he actually means by Yarok, he means, you know, yellow. Because in biblical Hebrew, there was no difference between Tzahov and Yarok. By the way, this is historically, these two colors are very, very close, yellow and green. And in the Talmud, it says, by the way, that Ishtosh Shlomo Amelech, you know, one of uh, Shlomo Amelech's wives, she was Yerakreket, she was greenish. And it actually doesn't mean that she was green, it means that she was blonde. Because the, the term in, in Biblical Hebrew and in Talmudic Hebrew for Yarok is, is most of the times is yellow. Now, why am I saying that? This is a sign for me that this man is actually operating in, a, in Talmudic Hebrew um, and in uh, a Hebrew that he reads in, in rabbinic literature, rather than, you know, modern Hebrew that is being modernized around the same time in Maskelic uh, uh, areas of Europe, let's say in Odessa, in the Gymnasia, in, in these places. Okay, so this is what I gather from his uh, from the way he works. But now let's go back a little bit more. Okay? So first of all, we're talking here about a story about a man who went to China with permission of President McKinley. Now, President, President William McKinley was a character. He was, uh, um, uh, he invaded Mexico. He did all sorts of things. I think he was murdered at some, uh, at some point and so on. I went to his library in Washington and I went through his letters and his journals. 
I did not find any record, and I was dying to find any record of me, 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 uh, him meeting with a Jew, uh, uh, you know, and giving him permission to go to, uh, uh, to China to discuss this and so on. But it, it makes sense to me that he would entertain the idea um, that, you know, someone would go with the American soldiers to China uh, um, for such a mission. Okay, because it happened in the past, and I will explain uh, how it happened in the past when we open the pages and flip through the book uh, uh, together. So why were the American soldiers going to China? Well, um, <clears throat> this is now a little bit about Chinese history. In 1899, China was entering yet another war with the European powers. There were two more. In fact, there were plenty more. And there's a lot of violence in the 19th century in China, violence that begins pretty much with the beginning of the 19th century and doesn't end on and off pretty much until 1980. Okay, Different formats, different problems, you know, different regimes. But at that time, you know, they are actually, uh, the Chinese are fighting colonial powers who are carving China like a cake. You know, if you look at the caricatures of China at that period, you will see that China is like a, like a pizza, a big pizza pie, and the European powers are with a knife carving uh, territories from it and taking it from themselves. Okay? Now, that, that creates a lot of resentment in China. In addition to that, um, and the, the first two times that China was uh, fighting with, uh, uh, with the West were the two opium wars. The first opium war was in 1840. China had lost territories such as Shanghai, such as Hong Kong, to the British. Then she lost more territories to the French. In 1864, which we're going to discuss here as well, because of another rabbi that we need to mention, um, in 1864, it fought uh, Europe again in a war that is called the Second Opium War. Opium was the main uh, topic at the time, and it kept losing. It, it, when it lost the war, it has to pay in territories that it gave, okay? In 1899, the European powers were resuming their efforts to colonize China even more and carve more territories. In addition to that, there's a very, very, very strong Christian influence. Um, a lot of Christian missionary activities in China, and that is seen as something that is connected with, you know, taking our territories, taking our land, but also changing our culture and changing our religion and forcing us to convert to Christianity, okay? Now, the locus, the main area in which these hostilities in 1899 begins, begin is in a territory called the Shandong province, where is the beginning of a, a very, very strong German uh, uh, presence and also a lot of missionary activity. Now, two things about Shandong province is that Shandong province is a peninsula in northeastern China. It's like about 600 kilometers uh, south of Beijing. I know this uh, 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 province uh, rather intimately because this is where I studied. When I studied in China 32 years ago, this is where I live. <clears throat> and this is where I went to school. That province is important in two, in two regards to us. One, <clears throat> it's sort of a holy peninsula because this is the birthplace of Confucius and considered one of the cradles of Chinese civilization. Second, and not less important, the people of Shandong are very proud of what they do in martial arts. And this is so strong because when I was a student there in 1990, you know, martial arts was part of our curriculum. So at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, you had to take a sword and go practice your sword. You know, all the students had to do that, and they were very, very proud of that. Okay. So the boxers, whom we call the boxers, is a movement of people from Shandong who they had some sort of a guru, uh, um, uh, some, someone, a, a leader who was practicing a form of Buddhism. You know, um, there was a history of uh, Buddhist uh, uh, rebellions in this area, you know, a lot of different uh, uh, things. Uh, and they had a great deal of hostility to Christianity, particularly to, Christ to, co to Chinese who converted to Christianity, but also to missionaries. In addition to that, 
because of the martial art element, they believed that they are protected by their gods and they are immune to Western bullets. And they were fighting without rifles. Now, the name in Chinese for the boxer movement is actually called Yi He Tuan, okay? Which is basically, um, which translates to something like, you know, um, unity and peace or unity and harmony, a band of unity and harmony, okay? It is the Westerners who gave them the term the boxers because they were fighting without rifles in bare hands like boxers. That's the name of the term. So in China, no one knows. In China, no one calls them the boxers. You know, this is a Western term, and it is one of the most important moments in you know China's fight against colonialism and against the West in China. So it's a rebellion with very strong religious overtones and traditional overtones as well. They basically believe that they are immune to the bullets, which wasn't true. Now the rebellion had two. The rebellion had two elements. The first one, the slogan was. Let's kill all the Christians and let's fight the Qing dynasty, which is the dynasty that was ruling China at the time. Okay. At, at some point, you know, when they realize, in fact, they can't really fight the dynasty, they said they removed the slogan, let's fight the Qing dynasty, and they said, let's just fight the let's just fight the Western barbarians. And the court of China began secretly supporting them. Now after you know having quite successful uh, uh, stage of rebelling against the uh, foreign powers in Shandong they began to march on Beijing um all the army of the rebels and the highlight of it was that they laid a siege on the quarter where all the foreign embassies in Beijing were at this point the Western powers begin doing something very, very important and very significant. They create a coalition of eight kingdoms or eight countries, including the United States, and they sent foreign armies to China to fight the boxers because they are now under threat. Okay? This is the context for Haga. Now, if we believe what he says, then Haga, upon who is in Boston, upon hearing that the American uh, President McKinley is about to send the American army to China, he supposedly went to the White House, asked for an audience with the, with the president, and says, please let me go with the American soldiers to China. And, um, because when I get to China, I will uh, look, look for the lost tribes. Okay. According to what you read at the end, you know, that he was captured by the Hinas uh, of China. By the way, Hina is Yiddish because in German you write China, you write it C-H and you pronounce it H. Okay? That's why in Yiddish it's written this way. Okay? So the Hina is, uh, the boxers, you know, they, they capture him. They clearly thought he was a missionary. Okay? Because... You know, if you're a boxer rebel you and you see an Orthodox Jew, sometimes you can't really differentiate between the, the Orthodox Jew and a, and, a Christian, uh, and a Christian priest. Okay, maybe the Christian priest, priest had a beard. I do not know. You know, he clearly had a beard. He, he looked foreign enough to them and, you know, he was captured. Poor man. I mean, I think that he, it, 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 I think it is sort of safe to say that, you know, had he understood the ideology of the boxer rebels, he would probably be sympathetic to them, you know. <laughs> But that wasn't the issue. He was on, so as a foreigner. So he went to China, and apparently he wrote reports of what he was finding in China and uh, sending them to a publisher in Europe, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, travelers, particularly travelers who were, knew that they were going to produce a unique travelogue, and this is a unique travelogue. It's one of the earliest travelogues in Hebrew. Okay, um, that is quite thorough. Um, um, so maybe he made a deal with someone that he's going to write a report about it. Maybe someone was interested in that and so on. Fact of the matter is, is that, you know, someone in Europe published that book and published that book twice. Okay. So this is the basic, uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, settings for that. We're going to go into more, a little bit more into the boxes uh, uh, when we continue.
But let's uh, move to the second, uh, to the first page. And actually, after you ask me the next question, we should talk about 1864, because the book actually begins in 1864. Uh, no, yeah. let's go there. I think what you're saying, yeah. you know, we, we mentioned China. You mentioned opium, by the way, for those that aren't familiar. Opium war is opium, opium poppy. It's a flower. It's a drug. Yeah. China, we're not going to go into this now. It came up. I did a podcast on the Sassoons. It came up there as well. And this is something China was plied with opium. And they were, you know, many fights about this. The British were involved there. Yeah. And they were all drugged up. Opium dens and things like that. So... Uh, with, as we mentioned, with Hagan, we're going to get more into him. And as he mentions the Jews of Kaifeng and, you know, looking for the Sarasa Shvatim and Sabat and all that, as you say, you know, it comes to the set end is what we have, the report. It's interesting that you look in President McKinley's files and didn't uh, see anything. And McKinley, for those that aren't familiar, so he's assassinated. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt becomes president after McKinley. Um, yeah. But for, for Haga. The first thing the book starts off with, and as we said, there's two names of the book, and I'll, I'll, it's on HebrewBooks.org. I'll put a link in the show's notes, and also I already mentioned here. There's a you sent me a good book, a very good general history book on the Boxer Rebellion. I'll link that also for those interested in learning more. Yeah. So the book starts off, and I'm sure listeners are curious about. So this Rabbi Haga, what, what's his interest in China? So you know the army goes, and he goes to McKinley, says, "Let me go." But how did he get this idea that he's going to go to China? And that yeah. the book starts off with this, and there's a letter in the newspaper of Magid in Europe from this Aaron Halevi Fink. And this is why we're going to pull back to 1864 and figure out who is this Fink and what is his letter and his connection yeah. to China and to Haga. Exactly. Now, um, we, we should talk, uh, we will get to the point, you know, whether uh, the two men went to China and so on, and you will hear my opinion. I would begin by saying that Fink didn't go to China. But Fink w- did what something that we can call a, an authentic lie. In other words, other than the fact that he didn't go to China and didn't find the lost tribes in China, everything, everything that he says in this letter is authentic. So what is the story? Hamagid uh, published in 1864 a mikhtav, like a letter, which is actually quite a long letter. And it begins with a very interesting setting. Okay, uh, It says that, you know, a few years ago, when the Kingdom of England had a war with China, the minister uh, of the Admiralty uh, of England, you know, sent a lot of soldiers, British soldiers from Calcutta in India, in eastern India, in boats to China. Okay. And Fink, Arona Levy Fink, tells us that, you know, he, uh, 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 there was a, there was a Jew who was operating, who was living in India at the time, that his name was Avram Stempel. He was uh, from Alsace, okay? In, um, it says here Alsace in France, but Alsace is a territory that moved between France and Germany during the 19th century, uh, etc. okay? And he, uh, um, he, when he heard that the British forces are moving from India to China to fight the war, he decided to hitchhike with them and get a trip to China to find the lost tribes. Now, we need to know two things about the British in in India, and I actually talk about it in the book. The British capture of India ignited a great deal of craziness and madness about the lost tribes in England because a lot of Christians in England you know, uh, um, who were uh, philo-Semitic, who basically, or loved the Bible, or etc., were really into the idea of fighting the lost tribes. And they were pretty sure that they're going to find them in India or in the East. Yes, and they had to, they had a lot of things to rely on. And, you know, India becomes a place where a lot of missionaries um, are looking for the lost tribes. So, in fact, it's not far-fetched that someone would go to a, an English captain the way... She, he think tells us that uh, uh, Stampel did. You know, he goes to uh, the English captain. He says, "Like, oh, I hear you're going to China. May I hitch? May I get on the boat with you and go to China to find the lost tribes?" Okay, so it's not far fetched to think about that. That you know, someone would say, "Okay, you know, come on the boat." Okay. Um, let us not forget that you know, in the age of uh, the age of discovery, you know, things like this happen. You know, when Columbus, you know, he had people. Uh, who speak Hebrew on his boats, you know, it was like he didn't know what he was going to find. And there's always like the idea that you're going to find people, ancient biblical people that we didn't see, and they might be speaking Hebrew or something like that. 
now. So the story goes that in 1864, this is the context of the Second Opium War, which we mentioned in the introduction, he goes to China, okay? And in China, he finds the lost tribes. And he finds a guy, a, 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 a person, you know, who's a Jew, who uh, um, he's, uh, happens to be a rabbi, um, a Jewish rabbi, um, and he has a conversation with him. And by the way, we should assume that the conversation is in beautiful Hebrew as well. Now, the reason why we should not believe this story is because it turns out that the rabbi, what at some point, you know, he says to him, what's the message for our brethren, you know, in Eastern Europe? And the rabbi begins with criticizing, you know, modern Jewish politics. He says, well, you know, all of these people, they think that they, they have this idea called emancipation and they're going to be free. They're going to be all of these things. Um, um, and he basically begins a critique of, you know, the trends that are going on in, 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 in Eastern Europe at the time, you know, and in Europe in general, in Jewish Europe, in terms of Haskalah, in terms of, you know, what he looks like as deserting the religion and so on. Okay. So what we should conclude from the first discovery, quote unquote, of the lost tribes in China, in fact, it was something that we should be very, very familiar with when we talk about the lost tribes. The lost tribes here are used as a sort of a mirror to the, re to the existing Jewish people that are living in the revealed world, in the world that is not beyond the river Sambation. And they are presented as more pious, more righteous, more observant. In other words, we, when we look at them, we should feel like sinners and we need to do tshuva. Okay? So basically what we have here is the first letter in Hamagid in 1864 is a sort of a Sifrut Musar. is a sort of, a, okay, let me chastise you a little bit. You know, uh, here I am, I found the, the lost tribes. And even though they are like in a deeper galut than we are, and, 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 and they are more disconnected and more, like look at how they observant they are. Look how, you know, they stick to their uh, uh, Jewish identity. They stick to the Torah, you know, and they don't entertain any also other ideas. Okay. Now, there is a real part of this where he talks about, you know, finding real Jews in different places, mainly the city of Kaifeng or Kaifeng Fu. Okay. Kaifeng is, um, is a former capital of China. It was a capital of China during a period called the Song period, about a thousand years ago, um, in, uh, until the Mongol conquest. Um, it was the way the Song dynasty had two two different uh, capitals. Kaifang was one of them. It's a beautiful city. And in fact, in that city, there was, there was a neighborhood, there were two neighborhoods of people from Persia who were merchants. Persia or Iran, you know, had very, very strong economic ties with China for a very, very long time. And Persian merchants were coming to China and they were living in China and they were trading and they were sending uh, goods between China and, uh, and uh, Persia and Iran. Now, among this Persian uh, uh, community, um, there were Jews, okay, Persian Jews. And we have uh, beautiful evidence we found a few years ago. Someone found a letter in Judeo-Persian, in other words, Persian written in uh, Hebrew letters, dated from the 10th century. Okay, someone by the name of Itzhak was writing a, a letter about his uh, business uh, uh, in China. It was found in the city of Kashgar, which is today part of China as well, but it's actually at that time was not, uh, was not part of China. Okay. So he, they, these Jews live there and they uh, um, is basically as part of the Persian community and they were doing quite well. Um, we have a lot of evidence about, uh, about them. They kept a synagogue and, you know, the community actually started breaking in 1849 when there was an earthquake and the synagogue was destroyed. But already before that, um, I think at some point in the Mongol period, there was, a, there was a, a rabbi who said to them, you know, as long as your first wife is Jewish, you can marry a second and a third wife who is not Jewish. Okay? And this is how they actually started becoming what we call sinified. In other words, they adopted the material culture and the language of the Chinese. Okay? Although... In the 16th century, we found a seal, 
of um, a, a Mandarin, a Chinese Mandarin who signed his name, his Chinese name was Chao, but he signed his also, he wrote his name also in Hebrew, Moshe, Moshe Chao, okay? That's like a real Mandarin. He was a judge in a Chinese court and he gave a ruling and he signed in, in Hebrew and in Chinese, okay? Many of these, many of these Jews also married the uh, uh, Muslim Persians um, because they were ve- becoming very, very small and they almost uh, uh, disappeared. Now, they live in China today. There are some of them still live there today, and many of them are returning to their Jewish roots. So that's the story of 1864. Now, that letter, when it is published, it resonates in Europe, okay? And people begin to, begin to think about China as the new place where you can imagine where the lost tribes are, And it is very convenient because you have all of these Europeans who are going to war with China and all you have to do is just ask them for a lift, you know. So if Stampel did it and went to China, why not Haga? Okay, Haga was familiar with the letter, clearly. Um, and more importantly, the publisher was familiar with the letter and the publisher of Haga's book in 1905 chooses to republish the article from Amagid, yes, probably as a sort of a proof that the 10 tribes do, do live in China, and also that there will be some benefit, some benefit for the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, yes, particularly in the, in the realm of Musa, in the realm of, uh, uh, um, in the realm of rekindling uh, uh, their Jewish, uh, let's say the Jewish flame in their hearts, okay? Uh, um, and, you know, in that regard, you know, um, this is, is very important. That explains why I think they changed the name. And this is a speculation. Because the first name is kind of blend. Metziata Serta Svatim. Finding the discovery of the, uh, of the Lost Rites. But the second title that he gives, Sefer Abrit Hadasha, Abrit Hadash, means a new covenant. In other words, it's a book, first of all, that is supposed to send a religious message. Uh, a message of renewing the unity of the Jewish people, making a new covenant, yes, through finding, uh, 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 through the idea of finding and discovering the lost tribes and reconnecting with them, you know, that we're supposed to basically also hasten the Geula, etc. We discussed, you know, that there is a very important association of the lost tribes with Mashiach. So that's the story of 1864. And now we're ready to enter into the travels of Uziel Haga. And before Haga, I, I just yes. want to say, before we get in, so we talk about Fink, and you mentioned that you don't believe Fink went. So you think this is just a fake, and he's using it as a literary device, or as just as a device, talking about the Sarah Sashvatim. Um, and as you said something interesting also, you talk about that they were, they portray them as, you know, holier and better than us. Uh, some listeners asked me after our first episode and the first couple episodes how it's interesting. We know, you know, from Tanakh, it was the other way, Malchus Yisrael were the sinners, and uh, over Malchus Yehuda, and then they become associated with they're the you know the holy ones hidden somewhere. But just in general about Fink, so if Fink is just a total fake. I mean, how do you know it's just a forgery? You know, not a forgery, but it's it's you, it's a, it's a letter that, he, in your mind, Fink actually wrote this letter, but it's not a true letter that he actually went. Is that how you view it? It's a somewhat fake. Yeah. Um. First of all, he knew something about China, and uh, he knew something about the Jews there. Because he was reading about it, okay? And I can prove it from the text in a minute. But it seems to me that, you know, if you really went to China, you'll have more details about the country. And he doesn't have any details about the country. He has mostly details about the, the Ten Tribes. And when you see the conversation between him and the rabbi of the Ten Tribes, it's mostly about Musa. It's mostly about Jewish politics, okay? Now... Mm-hmm. I know that I know that in Kaifeng there was no one in, in let's say he went to Kaifeng and he went to the Jewish quarter there um, the people that did not know Hebrew okay and I don't think that they knew much about you know Jewish politics in Eastern Europe okay so let alone form an opinion about it let alone form a critical opinion about it okay so in that regard I think I think that we should treat this as basically a As a book that you know goes into the genre of apocryphal books that you know the message is more important okay like like what the Talmud says about Sefer Eov you know this is Mashal yes uh, 
So the mashal here is about China, okay? And it's supposed to teach us something about ourselves, okay? Um, the reason why I'm also suspicious, suspicious about it, he doesn't really talk about the war. He doesn't talk about the opium war at all. I mean, how can it be that, you know, you go to China in such a turbulent period and you witness things that you've no one has ever seen, you know, a massive war, you know, uh, different people, and you don't pay attention to at all to what's going on there at all. You don't mention them. You know, what you talk about uh, uh, that, okay? And there are things that you see that I have also the clues. For example, on page 14, he says, I have asked them. Them means I have asked the, the, the 10 tribes, okay? How do they gonna, how, if they have any books or if they have any, uh, 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 if they have any uh, uh, books of memories and chronicles that their ancestors left them? And the response is where well, we had a stone and the stone had all sorts of memories of ours, but we could not read. Uh, we can't read and understand the language and the writing. And then it says, I asked them to show me the stone, and the stone is black. Um, it's that, it gives you, um, um, it's not very, very big, okay? And it's, um, um, and on the stone, there are uh, two uh, columns in Hebrew, in Hebrew letters, in Ashuri writing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what he's describing here, he describes a stele. Okay. Now, black stele was something that Chinese people erected all the time. You know, like when you build a temple, when you build a palace, you put a stele like this, basically. And then you do some carving on it. Okay. Now, Muslims and Jews used to do it too. But they used to do it in Chinese. And Muslims used to do it also in Arabic. Okay, so I think he was familiar with that, but then he was like uh, 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 talking about that. And when they were writing about it, there was a brief description of their religion because, you know, that's the stele that is outside. It's a sort of a monument that is outside the, the temple or the building, and it's supposed to explain the passerby what is inside. So there's a lot of explication about the nature of the religion. Okay, but lo and behold, what it says here... Um, what it says on the stone is something that I'm sure that wouldn't be found on the stone. It says like actually it's in Hebrew, so it's like for internal consumption. It's not for uh, it's not for the Chinese passersby. You know, you want to explain your religion. You know, you want to identify yourself. And it also says, and it's also like basically it's about you know ke'al motza pi adonai yichia adam. Okay, in other words, it's like very some biblical uh, 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 phrases there. That, you know, it seems to me that it, what is written on the stone that he supposedly found fits with the general message is that the, the people of Europe, the Jews of Europe, need to do tshuva. Okay? And it is the, the lost tribes who are telling them. Okay? In other words, it's too ideological to be true. It's too ideological to be true. Okay? And the reason why I mention this is because when we get to Haga, Haga is not that ideological. He's far more informed, informed and far more descriptive. Okay? And he describes what he says, including, you know, making comments about the shades of yellow that he sees in the colors of the people. Okay, on the skin of the people. However, our listeners are more than free to scrutinize this with their skills, you know. Um, and, it, um, and they compare, you know, the, the basic details that he does have about China and they may con conclude that the 1864 letter is authentic. And Fink's letter is page 4 to 17. So it's a pretty long letter, and he mentioned he met the rabbi, yeah. and he's very, very old, and, you know, kind of uh, trope, tropey kind of things yeah. that you would expect him to say. And But, you know, there's, there's a back and forth. He's talking about it, what's going on, et cetera. So there is that letter. Now, something about Haga, before we get into this book and what Haga yeah. says he sees and why you, you know, as you already mentioned, you believe Haga's letter more. But what do we know about Haga himself? Is it nothing? Because you said you looked and you don't see any correspondence with McKinley. And so actually, I'll mention one more thing before I uh, you know, turn the question over to you is that so Fink's letter ends on page 17. And then there's about a paragraph that goes from page 17 to 18, 
where the editor here in this book is putting in, and he's explaining that yeah. it first of all he calls it Hacha Maruzi, I'll call him like rabbi. And he says yeah. that, you know, he says the story. And he, so he, actually, he says that he went to McKinley. He doesn't say that he wrote a letter. He goes down to McKinley and, and he, yeah. you know, he mentioned it again in brief what happens. And he goes there and he says the letters and he writes a letter to his brother and then he gets captured the boxers, et cetera. But do we know anything about Haga from any other sources other than this book? Or this is all we know about him? Have you verified that he really existed other than this? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. However, um, I asked, I mean, at the time, you know, I asked a a very important uh, historian of American Jewry, and she heard the name, but I think she heard the name because of that book, but she didn't know anything about that. I am now, you know, since uh, since you and I have been coming back to this, um, I decided to do two things. First of all, I think I'm going to try to uh, uh, translate this uh, book. And see if we can publish it. Because in my opinion, and you know, I'm a historian of China. In my opinion, this is actually quite accurate. Quite accurate description of China during the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and um, what, he, uh, what he talks about uh, here is actually quite, uh, quite authentic. Okay. Um, it makes sense that you know, um, you know, you won't find anything. Maybe McKinley did meet the guy. Maybe somebody in the White House did meet him and says, "Okay, you can go um, uh, to China, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, and they didn't make a notation about it. McKinley, as I said, was quite a character. Okay, but apparently, all the American pre- presidents at that time were characters. You know, let's think about Roosevelt. Roosevelt went like on a hunting tour in Africa. Uh, and all of these things. This is where people were doing all sorts of things, okay? Um, and also, let's, let, let's not forget the degree of religiosity uh, at the time, you know, and, and, and the Christian American belief, believe in, 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 the, in the possibility of finding the lost tribes. In most cases, you know, finding the 10 tribes for Christians is far more important than to Jews, Okay. Because I think Jews have enough tourists in this world to deal with, you know, let alone, we, let alone finding others. I mean, and they don't travel. Jews don't really travel that much. They, they flee or they migrate, but they don't travel. Okay. I mean, it's very interesting that both of these cases, the travel is attached to war and it's attached to an imperial war. Okay. Um, so we don't know anything about Haga except what he says about himself. And it is, in fact, you, I concluded he was a rabbi, but you are the one who pointing it out to me for the first time that we need to pay, pay attention here that he calls him Hacham Mar. Yes. It seems to me that that man had rabbinic education. Maybe he didn't have smicha. Maybe he was like an active rabbi. Uh, makes sense because like he went on a, quite an adventure. But it's not someone who is not familiar with the world of Torah. Let's say this. Yeah. Okay, so let's now turn to, you know, Haga himself. So, okay, assuming he existed or, you know, we'll assume that. And this is, as you said, the letter does seem his, it's basically a letter. I mean, it's the safer because the book, let's tell, tell, to tell the listeners, as we said, there's the, you know, the beginning. And then there's, it goes from page four to 17 is uh, Fink's letter. And then 17 to 18 is a little paragraph. So essentially, Haga's material starts on 18, and the end of the book is page 56. So it's a small book, and it's essentially a long letter, one long letter written by Haga. Uh, And so that's basically what happens. So let's talk about Haga. And as you mentioned, translating, I think, will be a terrific idea. It's really fascinating. With Fink as well, the whole book, you know, doing the whole thing together. But uh, let's talk about this kind of travelogue letter, if you will, that Haga writes about China and Kaifeng and all these different things. Exactly. Uh, now, let us not forget, again, that the context that he's going is a context of war where there is a mysterious movement, and it's a militaristic movement. Now, in, in Ten Tribes' imagination, the, we sometimes uh, imagine them, and it's not a lot of, and it's many, many times, you know, they are imagined as militaristic. Again, because it's ha'efech. Why? The opposite. I mean, Jews, until... Uh, until the beginning of the 20th century, were not a militaristic people, okay? Um, they were, like, preferring, you know, the world of learning and trade rather than, you know, engaging in weapons. Um, and so in many cases, you know, both 
in in Jewish uh, uh, imagination, but also in Christian imagination, um, the lost tribes are produced as very belligerent militaristic people. Okay, and the Ichatwan or the boxers are a military movement, a military religious movement. So that makes it in his mind, maybe the boxers are in fact the lost tribes, an army of the lost tribes. And the fact that they wage war against Christianity only supports that imagination uh, as well. But he begins, and in page, uh, as you said, 1918, you know, it begins, and it's actually a very fairly accurate uh, beginning, which actually talks about the geography of the country. Um, And to me, it rings... Is not only someone who read about the geography of the country and 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 translates into Hebrew and publishes it, but actually someone who was there as well. How do I know that? Because, for example, he talks about um, he talks about the quality of the air. Okay, like in, for example, in page twenty, he says the air is good almost everywhere in China except in places where the water are standing and not moving, because there it is like kind of rotten and uh, the air is not very, very good, and you won't be breathing. uh, um, In in certain seasons, you can't really breathe well. Okay, Now, that's very, very important. To me, it's one of many, 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 many signs that he actually was there. Okay, Like, for example, it talks about the quality of the air. Okay. Um, and he talks about, you know, the, the summer, how, you know, it is very, very uh, um, cold in the north and how very hot in the south, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he talks about, you know, all of these things. Another thing that he talks about, and this is something that I mentioned about the, uh, um, eh, about the, the, the stuff that is green, yes. And he says, Nehareya hagdolim hema hanahar. Huang He, yes, um, who in their language is called Hanahar Hayarok. Now, there's a Nacha, he even puts this in Yiddish. So I don't know, I think it's Der Gelbe Plum. Am I correct in pronouncing it correctly? Uh, what page are you on? Page 19. Not the Yiddish expert, but let me, let me see. Gelbe is green. Yeah, I see there. Yeah. So, uh, the thing is that he says, and this is called Al Shem HaRefesh HaYarok, Asher Bekarkaito. And it is called this way, The and remember, when we say Yarok, we, green, we actually mean yellow. It's a yellow river, okay, which is the name Huang He in Chinese, the yellow river. And it is because of the mud. There is indeed, it's not mud, it's less. It's like a, a certain dust that covers the the ground in northwestern China and the Yellow River that moves from east to from east to west all the way to the Shandong province, you know, he pushes this green, this yellow earth uh, uh, with it. And, you know, his color like seem, looked like uh, yellow and that's why it's called the Yellow River. OK, so it seems to me that actually he was he was there, you know, um, he, he was there because he describes, you know, how this river you know, is very, very erratic. It's usually floods a lot. Um, and he, he there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of problems. And in, indeed, in Chinese history, you know, the Yellow River is always known as a very wild river, very problematic river. And, you know, you need a lot of efforts to control it. OK. Um, he also this and he goes on to discover to describe the river uh, in a great uh, a, a deal. Um, he also describes the other river, the Yangtze River, okay, where it comes from, etc., uh, etc. Et and he uses a lot of terms that are very local. Um, in other words, that he basically appears to me that he asked someone there, "Why do you call this river this way?" And the person says, "Here's why we call that river uh, 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 this way." Okay, and he talks about that uh, quite of very, very uh, systematically. Okay. Then he talks about the fruit of the land. Okay. And he talks about um, he talks about 
um, a lot of things that you know that they uh, that they have a lot of uh, um, a lot of fruits that they bring from Europe. He talks about you know different types that you know are poisonous. He makes comparisons to trees. He talks about the trees uh, and so on. Now, if you, you if you tell me, okay, well, maybe he will look to an encyclopedia or a book on China and he translated it into into Hebrew, you know, in order to authenticate his studies, you know, it seems to me that that's not the case because why would someone do that, you know, in order to uh, uh, go over? Because if he's if he wants to write a fake book about finding the lost tribes and sending it sending a a religious message to the people of to the Jewish people of Europe, okay, he would brush over all of these details and wouldn't care about them. He says, Well, China is big. I went to China, found the lost tribes, the way Fink does it. Okay. And then zooms in on the conversation with the lost tribes that he found and with their uh, stuff. But here he goes very, very systematically, as intrigues to me as someone who was there. Okay. Uh, um, because uh, to the best of my judgment, and I know China. Uh, uh, quite well, you know. I mean, he 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 basically knows a lot of things that unless you live there, you wouldn't know. And like, it's not enough to read it in a book. Okay. Um, I also think that you know, it's more the very serious chance that this man wasn't really reading uh, um, literature outside, you know, the Jewish literature. Okay. So it's not like this man was like reading encyclopedia articles or travelogues. Uh, uh, there um, as well, okay. Um, so that's basically the entire part of that. Uh, the the entire part of the first uh, uh, part of uh, of the book, a very very good description um, of China and, and so on. He sometimes cites other people, particularly when he talks about the demography. Okay, which seems to be defeating my argument that he didn't read any other uh, sources of China, but actually went there. But I think the fact that he mentions only few sources, only few people as outside sources, suggest to me that most of the information is actually is from firsthand uh, uh, observation. Okay, this is why I make the case that this book is authentic. Someone who actually went and actually wrote a letter back. So, and and how about so now that you're making the case that Rabbi Huaga went and it actually is authentic, how yeah. you know you mentioned you want to translate it. It's interesting as having you know travel log, especially in Hebrew from this time period. How about as a Chinese historian? What is this? Does this book tell us interesting, unique things about China, or it just confirms a lot of other things that we know? Before we get, we'll get to the Jews of Kaifeng and the Sarsa and stuff in a minute. Yeah. Okay. What is interesting in this book? Um, it is basically how a Jewish traveler who is clearly not uh, um, considering himself like as a modern person. In other words, he's not secular. He's not, uh, he's like writing on China, you know, through the world of, you know, rabbinic literature. Okay. So that would be very, very interesting to me to see how, you know, China is reflected actually in Hebrew language that is very, very specific. For example, you know, when it talks about, you know, writing history in China is very, very important. It's a very important practice. It goes back millennia. Um, Historians took their job very, very seriously. History was supposed to educate the, the people to avoid the mistakes of the past. The emperor was supposed to learn this history and read the history of past dynasties, etc., etc., etc. So, for example, when he talks about writing history, you know, he talks about uh, um, he talks about it and he calls it divrei yamim. Okay, in other words, he uses a biblical term that we're very, very familiar with. You know, when you read the book of Esther, so, you know, you have the, the book of Esther describes how the king, Ahasuerus, was like not sleeping at night. And then they would come and read him from the book of Divrei. I mean, they would read him a history book of uh, uh, the book of, of, of Persia, okay, uh, some chronicles. And he does the same thing, okay. Or, and he talks about, uh, um, he talks about, uh, um 
how they decide, you know, uh, when uh, what what to do when an emperor uh, when the emperor dies, you know, and what they're gonna do uh, uh, with all of with, with all of that. He writes about it in a very very emphatic way, um, but at the same time, you know, he's basically he, he apparently he loves what he sees. But at the same time, he talks about uh, he talks about he translates it into into his uh, halachic world. For example, when he talks about um, when he talks about the emperor, okay, so he uses terms that we are um, familiar with when we talk about God. You know, in the siddur, it's like uh, he he brings people up, you know, and he brings people down. You know, he you've called Avona Mordim, you know, Vekoshre Kesher, El Hagbnehem Le Shomem Shimsalat Ish Ador. So in other words, he's like Poken Avod Avot Albanim. He's like he's punishing people, he's punishing the future generations, and so on. That's actually very, very accurate to say. Because in China, you know, um, if you were accused of a political crime in the pre-modern period, you know, the punishment was never ended just with you. It usually ended with the family as well. Okay, and he knows that. Okay, and he even say that at some point, you know, um, the emperor is punishing uh, families of rebels, you know, and shaming them that they, they will carry the shame for nine generations. Okay, for nine uh, 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 for nine generations. In other words, he talks about it uh, uh, like this. Okay, now this is an emperor. Who is also this man is also aware of the fact, and it, it was a little strange for people to realize that at the time, even today, that China actually is a very diverse country. Okay, it has a lot of nationalities, it has a lot of religions, etc., etc., etc. And then he says, he talks about the leumin, the nations of China, not just the Chinese nation, but the nations of China. Okay, and he says here leumav kedivre Elohim. In other words, his nations, the nations who are subordinate to the emperor, you know, are like the way God it says, Yes, and he's going to say uh, um, they are doing exactly, you know, they're treating him as the word, they're treating his word as the word of uh, God, and they do everything. Yes, and if anybody who's trying to uh, uh, desecrate the, the emperor or disrespect the emperor is going to be cruelly uh, 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 punished, etc., etc., etc. Even mentions here obliquely a case, you know, of two uh, high-end ministers who rebelled and, you know, and they were punished and so on and so forth. Again, like, it seems to me that he, all of that background information is stuff that he witnessed, uh, etc. Okay. This is all of this part is like around page 23, 24, when he talks a great deal about, you know, the uh, the emperor. Yeah. Now, what about the Jews of China, the Jews of yes. Kaifeng and their and hug him and their their actions and their, their history? I mean, that's what he you know is interesting yes. about. And I'm sure listeners are interested to hear about that. And and let's be clear, the Jews of Kaifung, as you said, are not a Sarasash Faltim. They have their origins from Persian Jews. And Rabbi Haggad understands and he knows this, to be clear. Yes. That's again speaks to the authenticity of the book. He doesn't try to say these are the lost tribes. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Jews of uh of uh Kaifung. Okay. The Jews of Kaifung arrived, as you say, they, they were from uh, the Persian world, okay? And they were Persian-speaking. Um, in terms of their, the way they dress, the way they behave, they were, they were like any other Persian in the town, in, in, in China at the time, there was Muslim. And in the Mongol period, we have a lot of Persians in China because the Mongol armies had a lot of Persian, uh, from, Persians from Central Asia and from even from Iranian territories that came with them to China and participated in the Mongol war against China. This is around 1260, okay? 1260, 1267, you know, the Mongols established the Yuan dynasty uh, in Beijing, okay? The Song dynasty, which I mentioned over before, is uh, o- almost over. Uh, um, it, it all but disappeared. And they, um, and the Mongols don't trust the Chinese. They don't trust the Chinese, 
Um, and since, you know, they brought a lot of people with them, you know, they didn't have a bureaucracy, the Mongols per se, but they knew how to incorporate and rely on other government systems and other bureaucracies. So they bring with them a lot of Persians, both as soldiers and also as technocrats and bureaucrats. So in fact, the lingua franca, not the lingua franca, but the language that is used in China in terms of the administration during the Mongol period, this is around the 13th, 14th century, is actually more is actually Persian. I mean, towards the end of the Mongol period in 1368, the Chinese makes a com- make a comeback, and most of the bureaucrats are Chinese themselves, but they have a strong Persian element. So these Persian Jews are part of that Persian element that comes to China already probably in the 10th century, when the trade between the Tang Dynasty, which is the before the Song, and Iran really resumes, you know, but at the same time, the Indian Ocean becomes a Muslim ocean um, um, with a very, very strong Persian and uh, um, Arab uh, uh, presence there, you know, and, and the same thing happens in the Silk Road in, in, uh, on the land. In other words, between China and uh, Europe, uh, the, the road that connects uh, China, let's say China and the Mediterranean, you know, it becomes very much Persianized. Okay, I mean, Persian becomes a dominant language, and you have a lot of travelers who use that language. Okay, now some of these uh, merchants settle in China, they buy land, they buy uh, uh, buildings, and they basically think that they are going to stay there and keep continue trading. Eventually, these people become part of the population. In other words, they adopt, even if they stick to the religion, they adopt the material culture of China and the language. The Jews of Haifeng are by def- for sure are Persian. Okay, we know that from the liturgy. Although uh, many years ago there was someone who, by the name uh, a scholar of religion by the name of Professor Tzvi Verblovsky uh, of Jerusalem, he found Yemeni Jewish liturgical uh, elements in their liturgy. Okay, I I am in no way able to to comment on that. You know, I mean, I need to be familiar more with the Yemeni liturgy and with Persian liturgy, and I'm not. Okay, I don't know exactly what he was basing this on. The on that, I would rather stick to the fact that you know, ethnically, these Jews were Persian. Okay, now they lived there quite. Uh, uh, they lived there okay, and there is a very interesting uh, uh, incident that we they come up. Uh, we learn about them in the Chinese sources. And what do we learn in the Chinese sources? The Mongol emperor Kublai Khan decreed at some point that no form of slaughter other than the Mongol slaughter is allowed. Okay, He wanted people to slaughter animals before they eat them they made the way the Mongols uh, uh, did it. And that created a huge problem for both the Jews and the Muslim communities of China because... Both the both of them have halachot shechita, you know, rules of slaughtering that are quite elaborate, and they are part of the kosher uh, laws or the halal, uh, if we want to use uh, the Muslim term for kosher, you know, in this regard. And that meant basically that they, if they can't sla- they can't slaughter their own way, they cannot eat meat. So the Jews and the Muslims of Kaifeng created a unified delegation. And they went to the emperor to plead with him to allow them to slaughter according to their own customs. And that delegation made its way to the Chinese records because that a meeting that didn't have did happen. And you know, it was the, the Chinese chronicles kept uh, kept that uh, um, kept the record of that meeting. Okay, um, the community basically began losing touch with Judaism and with Jewish identity, um, I would say in the Ming period, in the after 1368, the Mongols were kicked out of China in a dynasty that was very, very proud of its Chinese origins and was trying to, called the Ming dynasty, and was actually trying to reverse a lot of the Mongol policies, even though they adopted a lot of many others, you know, they were particularly hard on foreigners. And whereas the Mongol elite left China and went back to Mongolia, all of the bureaucratic elites and the economic elites that came with the Mongols in previous periods and lived in China, they didn't leave. They basically were part of the population. 
but they were foreigners. They had their own quarters in, the, in different cities. They kept their language. They kept their identity, etc., etc., etc. But Ming Dynasty policies, beginning in 1368, encouraged um, the adoption of Chinese material culture, encouraged use of Chinese culture, and in fact, you know, um, encouraged everybody to become Chinese. Now, with Islam, it's more dramatic because uh, um, we can see, for example, the Chinese mosques. Um, the architecture changes now, like they build them more of like a Chinese architecture. The minaret, which is a tower that is used in Islam for the call of prayer. Yes, because you have five, time, five times a day you have to pray. So call of prayer is very, very important. In China, you don't have the call of prayer um, in Muslim quarters because, it many, because it's very clear it was too conspicuous. And whereas the mosque inside looked like in any other mosque in the Muslim world, Outside, it looked like uh, any other Chinese building. In other words, people were trying to look less and less and less conspicuous as foreigners. And we should assume that the Jewish population went through the same processes. In other words, they uh, um, were sticking to their religion, but in terms of their ethnic customs and so on and so forth, they were becoming more and more Chinese. This is also true because... Unlike the Muslims, the, the Jewish community of Kaifeng was tiny, okay? I mean, Muslim, Muslims were maybe hundreds of thousands, you know, even more. But the, 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 Chinese com- the Jewish community was tiny, you know, maybe several families, okay? So they had a problem of also of marriage. So they tried to do it in two ways, you know, how to deal with the questions of marriage and the dwindling numbers of the community, okay? Because they were now disconnected from the Jewish world in, in, in the Iranian world. What they did is, first of all, they had one rabbi who said to them, you know, as long as your first wife is Jewish, you can marry uh, Chinese women as the second and the third wife, etc., etc., etc. So within two generations, pretty much everybody there uh, uh, was Chinese. The second uh, part of it is that we have a lot of evidence about intermarrying with the Muslim population. In other words, the Persian Muslims in Kaifeng were good enough or close enough to the Jewish population for marriages, okay? So, and, and, and maybe it also was a way to keep their unique identity as, as, as people who are somewhat different, you know? In other words, they married into another minority, a bigger minority that could ensure their survival, but they married into it. Despite all of that, a measure of Jewish life continues, you know, and they, they have Torah scrolls, which we now know because of the way they were writing, they were know that they were writing by people whose dominant language was Chinese because they do not differentiate between Lamed and Resh. Okay? And sometimes you see that they made a spelling mistake where it says Le'olam, they write Re'oram, you know, in other words, with Resh rather than in Lamed. In other words, that would suggest to us that, you know, these people, were the dominant language was Chinese as opposed to Hebrew. But they were still, they were copying... Uh, uh, the Torah and using it, their synagogue burned down in an earthquake in 1849, and that, that basically was the end of the community. Now, it, however tiny this Jewish community was, it always ignited the imagination, the wild imagination of Jews and non-Jews outside, because China was so far that people were thinking, okay, wow, you know, if there are Jews there, you know, maybe uh, uh, maybe the less, lost tribes are there as well. Okay, and I'm going to mention two cases that are important. First of all, Haga went there and found them. Fink claims that he uh, he found them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and these were the lost tribes and so on. Okay. But in the 16th century, the great missionary, Catholic missionary, Italian Catholic missionary, Matteo Ricci, went to China. And he was very much interested in finding evidence, you know, of other religions. He found Islam, and he wasn't very happy about that. And then, much to his uh, surprise and joy, he heard, uh, when he was in the capital uh, of Nanjing, he heard that in Kaifeng, there is a Jewish community. So he raised money, and he invited a man who he identifies in his records as the Jew I, you know, another Chinese name, 
Um, and he interviewed this man, and he wrote about this interview in his record. And the interview is very, very funny, okay? Uh, because he showed him a picture of um, uh, Mary, and he says, do you know this woman? He showed him a painting of, the, uh, of Mary, uh, and he says, do you know who this woman is? And the Jew says, of course, this is Rachel, okay? And then he showed him a picture of Jesus, a painting of Jesus, and says, do you know who this man is? And the Jew says, yeah, of course I know this man. He's, this is Jacob, our patriarch. Okay. So it, in other words, it was a kind of a dialogue uh, between a Christian and a Jew, you know, somewhere in China where the, the missionary was trying to find out how much this Jew knew about Judaism, but also about, um, about Christianity. Okay. Now, when the news of Matteo Ricci's encounter with Jews in China reached in Europe, they ignited another thing that was actually quite significant um, in terms of European uh, Jewish history, and that is the career of a very, very important rabbi by the name of Menashe ben Israel. Menashe ben Israel was in Amsterdam, and he was uh, uh, coming of a converso family, in other words, a Portuguese or Spanish family that was forcibly converted to, uh, converted to Christianity. And like many others in the Portuguese community of Amsterdam, these people fled the Inquisition in Portugal and in Spain. And when they arrived in Amsterdam, which was a tolerant city, they returned to their Judaism. And this is remarkable because most of these people were not born Jewish. Okay, in other words, they didn't have Jewish education as children, and you know he was one of them. Spinoza is another one, although Spinoza was already born Jewish. So Manasseh Ben Israel becomes a very, very important rabbi. And when he hears about the findings of the lost tribes, or not the lost tribes, when the finding of the Jews in China, he thinks about the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel has a prophecy that says that Mashiach will come when the Jewish people will be spread all over the world. And he says, look, we have a, we have a man that said that he found the, the lost tribes in, in the Americas. This is the first evidence that he has, that the Native Americans, um, uh, the Native Americans, you know, are the lost tribes. So that's already in America. And now we have evidence that they are in China. Okay, so Menashe Besson, Ben Israel tells himself, okay, wait a minute, you know, I mean, we are nearly everywhere in the world, and if we will be all, everywhere in the world, Mashiach will come. So he knows about one place in the whole world where you don't have any Jews. Do you know where it is? England. Exactly, England. So this is the basis of his mission to Oliver Cromwell, you know, to cross the channel and go to England to allow, to, to have the British authorities allow Jews to return after nearly 400 years because Jews were, the Jews of England were expelled from England from the British eyes in the 13th century, you know, and the, 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 that was the mystical part of his uh, dimension of his mission to Cromwell, to England, basically because he wanted to hasten the the Geula by saying, okay, let's allow Jews to return to England. This way the prophecy will be, uh, will be completed. Okay, of course, uh, uh, he writes this about a book, which is a great book. I mean, this is the book that because of, because of that book, I became very much interested in the Lost Tribes, called Mikveh Israel. Okay, which if you didn't discuss, maybe we should discuss in the future. It's a wonderful book. And it, by the way, that book also begins with a fake news, yes, of Metziat Aserta Shvatim in Peru, okay? Matazinos. By the way, yeah, we have here, you know, the fake guy from 1864 is uh, Aaron Alevi Fink, and the guy um, who swears in the synagogue in Recife that he found the lost tribes, his name is Aaron Alevi Montesinos, yes? So if any of the listeners, his name is Aaron Alevi, please don't find the lost tribes, okay? <laughs> It's it's the parallel throughout, you know. You always see these kind of they're using that Sarah as a as a they're using it or they're making up a story. And yeah, my, I did have an episode on Montezinos, and there's an episode yeah. on the Menashe Ben Israel and the hope of Israel Mikveh Israel. And it, yeah, there's there's 
you know, those are really fascinating work. Menashe Ben Israel. I mean, by the way, all his works, he's really interesting, fascinating person. Did a bio on yeah. him a few years ago uh, with Stephen Nadler and his biography that he did on him. But anyway, so yeah, back to uh, Haga. And uh, so, you know, these are the Jews of Kaifeng. I mean, where are they? You know, what's funny about this book is, uh, I'll just say, yeah. is that the book, so the first one is with Siyas Aser Shvatim. This one is Sefer Abris HaChadosh in Manora Sampatian by Medinas China, right? In China. But it's not exactly about the Aseris Ashvatim in the sense that he's saying the Jews of Kaifeng and here is China. He's not. He didn't exactly find the tribes. Yes, and he was honest to say that he didn't find them, or he was honest enough not to say that he did find them. Let's be more accurate, okay? Um, and apparently, he fell in love with the place because, for example, he talks about he talks about the Chinese classics and about the books. He even translates some of the. The wisdom, the Chinese wisdoms, uh, uh, into Hebrew, and when he does the translation, okay, um, he does it. You know, um, he he does it in the sense that he basically uses biblical Hebrew. For example, you know, Confucius, you know, talks a lot about the straight path, the Tao, okay. And he translates here, he says, Ish emunim lo yelech akalkalot. Yes, akalkalot, like, you know, this is from Shirat Vora, you know, like uh, a crooked way. Okay. Um, and when he when he finds a parallelism, you know, for um, in Confucius that, you know, parallels with the Talmud, he actually makes a point and he says that, you know, uh, for example, when he says that like, you always have to walk in the straight path, then he basically quotes from Masechet Shabbat. He says, Torah achat ve'ishara behalichot adam. Yes? He says, Shabbat lamed aleph. You know, he gives you the Talmud, uh, um, uh, um, uh, about that. Okay? So, he really goes into, um, um, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh details, uh, etc. about that, you know? Um, and now, again, to the question of the sources, when he talks about other sources, he mentions them, okay? In other words, he says, he doesn't say, well, I copied all of this from an encyclopedia article. He basically says, look, and I, and I mentioned that. And for example, on page 36, you know, he talks about the Muslims, okay? Um, which are very, very important because if you want to go meet in the, the Chinese, the Jews of uh, Kaifeng, you, you're basically going to meet the Muslims because they live in the, in the Muslim quarter. Okay. Um, and then he talks about the difference in the heads and so on and so forth, but he also talks about, you know, other uh, uh, people who went there because there were a lot of people who were attracted to this mysterious community and when they were written a lot about that. Okay. So he actually mentions. Other things, you know, what other travelers, you know, not Jews, mentioned about this group, about this uh, Jewish community, you know, and he mentions them because, you know, they were, uh, he mentioned stuff that was published in Poland as well, okay? Um, in other words, this is what was in circling, th this information was circling um, um, in Poland, and he was very, uh, it was somewhat at least familiar um, with that, okay? And then he says, for example, In other words, they do have Bibles. But he says they have Bibles in the language of China. Yes? Because they do not know Hebrew. Now, if you read the conversation between the Aaron Alevi Fink, that Aaron Alevi Fink between him and the rabbi of the Lost Tribes, it's the rabbi knows perfect Hebrew. And here Haggah tells us these people do not know Hebrew. Okay, now, and then he says that we, you, 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 you will find also a lot of the believers in Muhammad who came there after um, their religion, uh, after their uh, religion uh, um, uh, appeared on earth, you know, uh, he uses the term, you know, yes, um, and so on and so forth, you know, and he talks about, and he talks about them uh, as well. Okay, and he also talks about the Christian missionaries, okay, um, and their uh, activities and what they would do. And this is when he gets into the into the boxers. And this is a very very 
very accurate description that, you know, it seems to me that like, one had to be in China because he says, look, um, even the Jesuits are there, you know, he says that the Christians started coming here at the end of the 16th century, uh, according to their counting, and the Jesuits were there, and they came in in order, limshoch nefashot leemunatam ot keshanim kadmoniot. In other words, they've been doing the missionary work the way they were always doing, okay? And only later they came, you know, uh, uh, the English and the Americans and the French, and they were they also tried to do uh, uh, all of these things. And then he says something about something that is very interesting, okay? One of the things that colonialism does is change the culture of uh, specific uh, countries where they colonize, okay? Um, and claim that, you know, the country of the, the, the culture of the colonizers is inferior to European culture. And he describes this in this very interesting way. He says, well, after all these Jesuits who came in with the missionary work, you have all of these Americans and French uh, uh, missionaries, and they, they also started, you know, elevating their faith, you know, their Christian faith, yes, and fight against the nonsense, he says, Havalim, but also the sacred customs of, that are, the customs that are sacred for the people of the land. In other words, the indigenous people of the land, which is basically what colonizers do when it comes to the uh, uh, cultural dimensions of their mission. In other words, what the French was to call mission civilicatrice. In other words, we're coming to all of these savages in order to civilize them. Okay. So, and he says there's something very important. He says the Jesuits did not do that. The Jesuits were only interested in, you know, making, converting to Christianity, but they were not really talking about that. Uh, um, they were not talking about, you know, colonizing uh, the place. And he says, and this is, by the way, the source of the quarrels between between uh, um, the Jesuits who were Catholics and the um, and the later missionaries, which is mentioned in Americans, there's a very serious American missionary activity in the 19th century that uh, um, he witnessed. Okay, now um, he goes on to talk about that a lot, and thereby also provides us with background for the hostility, the extreme violent hostility that the, some of the people in China or many of the people in China feel towards Christianity and Christian missionaries at that period. Okay, And again, um, to me, it rings as if he, he was uh, uh, there. You know, He did some homework before going there and he was clearly looking, uh, talking about uh, 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 people um, and, and so on, and like to the degree that he's even able to differentiate between you know important culture, which is Christianity, and the local culture um, as well. So, what happens to Rabbi Haga? I mean, we can talk more about the Jews of Kaifeng. He ends up talking more about their customs. He ends up, uh, by the way, the end of the book ends up, the last thing is, he mentions, It's interesting to end off with. I don't know if that's, you know, because of the Rabbi Haga's sad end that they're ending, you know, or just coincidence that they ended up with the prayer you say for an oval. Yes. Uh, someone is sitting Shiva. It's interesting that that's what the, that's the end of the book. And that's the end of the book. It just ends abruptly. Yeah. It's funny to me, I don't know if you thought this, that there's no editor's note after the end of uh, Haga's letter. It just, ends with this prayer but so there's more here i don't know if you had anything more to say on some of the customs and he mentioned some of the you know he goes through geography and there's a lot it's you know it, it really fascinating and i'm sure as a for a historian a really useful uh, book but, yeah i mean what happens to haga do what did you come exactly. out with okay what what happens to haga first of all the fact that the book ends abruptly also lends uh more support for the notion that this wasn't fake in other words, this man didn't sit at home on a desk in Boston and write this book. He wrote a letter, and he probably was planning to write more letters. Okay? And apparently, you know, his interlocutors in Europe, all they could find out that he disappeared. And maybe because, you know, the West was reporting and there was a, the foreign press in China was reporting on the going on, 
maybe they were able to surmise that he was uh, captured by the boxers. But we don't really have we don't really have any evidence that he was captured by the boxers. But I think that his disappearance was understood by the people of his time that he was captured by the by the boxers because the boxers were capturing and torturing a lot of people who looked like him. So even though there's no evidence, I buy that. Okay. I buy the fact that, you know, his disappearance, you know, had to do with uh, that. And since he, because he was Jewish and he looked kind of weird, you know, no one really paid attention to it. Although the, the foreign press, uh, when I was doing the research, the foreign press was not digitized yet, but now I can actually read the foreign press and maybe I will find out if there's a notice about someone because we have a lot of information about boxer, boxer rebellion. Since the Western involvement there, there's a lot of reports. And there were British, there were journals in English and in French were coming out on China for the communities of the colonizers there, of the people who lived there, and they were reporting of these things. Maybe this is how they knew. But now we should just imagine, you know, what, what happened. So this man is traveling, you know, poor man. He's traveling in eastern China pretty much, you know, and he makes his way to the north where he lands into the territory where the lost, uh, where the boxes are active. And they were specifically targeting missionaries and Christian Chinese and generally foreigners. So it lands, uh, it rings, it sounds very, very safe to assume that they were indeed, you know, they, he, they indeed captured him, and we know what they were doing to the people who they captured. They, you know, they put them in, a, in some sort of a prison. They tortured them. Sometimes they tried to ransom them, or they tried to negotiate over them. But many of them were simply just killed. Okay, it was a religious movement. It was an anti-colonial religious movement. Okay, uh, um, that really strongly believed in, you know, uh, they had very strong faith in what they were doing to the degree that they were not afraid fighting. Uh, with their bare hands against rifles, okay, or with with spears. In other words, they were fully aware of the superior weapons of the of the uh, foreign powers, and yet they were saying that they were immune to them, okay, and they were be protected if they went uh, um, they were, went to fight them, okay. Maybe he was fascinated by these people when he realized they were not not Jewish, not lost tribes, or not anything. Uh, 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 like this, okay. Um, we can just assume that you know what is written in the first uh, page that you read that when we started um, that he was captured and he died in prison after uh, terrible yisurim and and keivim and he wasn't even buried. It makes uh, sense to me. It seems to me also that there was no one to ransom him. In other words, you know, thinking about hostages. In other words. The, the boxers sometimes captured like a big deal, you know, American soldier or a captain or a British one or a diplomat or something like that. And there were negotiations to ransom these people. But who would ransom, you know, an Orthodox Jew from America, you know, who who speaks Hebrew, you know, who would going to ransom him? No one. Okay. And maybe at that point, you know, he basically uh, lost uh, lost his life, you know. It also strikes me as a rare name. I've never really met anyone with the name of Haga. Yes, Uziel, not even common to, you know, one of the rabbis, uh, the chief Sephardic rabbi of, of mandatory Palestine was uh, Uziel, Arav Uziel, yes. And it's a name that you know, but it's not very common either. And that was his last name. Uh, yeah. Ben Uziel. That, was that was his last name, not his first Uziel, name. Yeah, and- yeah. Yeah. And for for the listeners, you know, we keep pronouncing it Haga. We're not doing that in American wise. He he actually spells it. It's spelled Haga. Hey, Aleph Gimel Aleph. It's not like Haga. We're saying Ha. It's spelled Haga. Yeah, so I don't know exactly. what that we're and Uziel. It's like, and it says, right. but it says from Boston. Did you look any? There's no records in Boston of anything. Let me tell you, I lived in Boston. I even went several times to the Rebbe of Boston. You know. Because uh, they told me, someone told me that they have a minion for Israelis. Uh, so on Holamoid, you can go there. Um, even that, you know, he, and no one knew anything about this man. No one knew anything about this man. I mean, yeah. And of course, the Hasidut of Boston is much later. So 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, listen, it's a fascinating book. As you said, I'm going to link to it on HebrewBooks.org. I'll link to that. I'll link to the Boxer Rebellion book. In your book that we discussed earlier, The Ten Lost Tribes of World History, pages 215 to new two, 215 to 219, you discuss Haga. So he's mentioned in there. You know, we don't go into nearly as long as we just did here. And I think if you would translate it, it would be a wonderful uh, service. It's really a... Yeah, uh, it, it reads very easy. Anyone who reads Hebrew, I know you meant there are some Yiddish words, but it is an easy read. It's interesting, um, but I, it probably would do well to be translated with some notes and kind of give the background of China for those that aren't familiar with what exactly. they're reading. Now, let me just end with this. So that's really okay. Haga and his you know sad story. Let me end with, we kind of mentioned this in an earlier podcast, but being that we're discussing it, we're focused on China here and you're the Chinese expert and the Lost Tribes expert. What about the lost tribes being associated with China? Not the Chinese Jews and the Jews of Kaifeng we discussed. That this whole okay. persistent, pervasive legend that the lost tribes are in China. I think we mentioned earlier where this came from and other people talk about yeah. it. But just to put a bow on it here because it's really, you know, exactly. ties into so, this episode. Yeah, so let's return to this for a second. You know, uh, I did mention this in the earlier podcast. I mean, first of all, I mean, the East, the East is... Um, is a good candidate for, you know, finding the lost tribes because, you know, the general, the biblical record does tell us they were exiled east, okay, into Aremadai, yes, uh, the cities of Medes or Media, okay. Aremadai, it's a province, it's a very, very large province in northern Iran that stretches all the way to, to Afghanistan, okay. So by the time you get to Afghanistan, you are in China. And, you know, first of all, India was a good candidate. There's also a very low, a very strong connection because we know we have traditions about Bnei Avraham who went to India. And I remember once, you know, when I was a student at UCLA, so uh, the rabbi of our synagogue, you know, rest in peace, he was a, quite a character. Uh, he told me, you know why the Indians are so poor? I said, why? He says, because Aseret Shvatim, when they went there, they were begging for money. And they, they begged and begged and begged and begged, and then the Indians became poor because they became impoverished because the the lost tribes took all their money. Okay, so it's a, there is a there are long traditions that they are in the east, but once the east becomes known, okay, you need a new east that is unknown. So once you know India is colonized and we have a lot of information about India, and we kind of know that okay, no lost tribes in India, that then you have to go to another location that is just even more mysterious. And there you have, I mentioned this in the context of uh, the province of Sichuan, okay? The, the Talmud is always asking where are the lost tribes. The Talmud, the sages of the Talmud are always puzzled by this, you know? And there is a debate in the Mishnah, you know, whether they're going to come back, they're not going to come back, etc. So, you know, I mean, the, the Talmud is quite sober about the, the the problem of the of the lost tribes, okay, but in, you can't give up on them. So you keep pushing them to territories that are unknown, and you say, well, that's where they are, and this is why we don't hear about them because we don't have any connections with these territories. But once the territory is connected, what you need now to do is like to say, okay, let's search this territory and find clues in our scripture that would support the presence of the lost tribes there. And in one of the Midrashim, it says, you know, they went to Eser Galuyot, and one segment of the lost tribes, you know, were covered by clouds. Yarad Alea Anan. Okay. And there is a province in China called Sichuan that is usually very foggy and covered with clouds to the degree that the province south of this, of Sichuan, is called Yunnan, which means south of the cloud, which suggests that the, the province of the north is known as the cloud. Okay, so who knows, you know, when when uh, uh, people like think in their imagination or people like Haga, they went to and they saw Sichuan, which is like a mountainy province covered with clouds. This is OK. This is what the Talmud meant when it says, Yarad ale ma'anan. they were covered by a cloud. Yes, um, etc. OK, um, but one more thing about that to basically talk to the title, Sefer Habrit. OK. What he's talking about in the end is the desire for unity, the desire for reuniting, you know, kibbutz galuyot, kibbutz uh, uh, being connected with all, all, all the people. That has a very, very important message 
And regardless if we find or we don't find the 10 tribes, you know, the, that message of, you know, trying to keep the people intact despite of Galut, despite of being scattered all over earth, you know, to, be, to reach out to everybody it is a very, very important message, uh, uh, um, very important message, you know, that he wants to send. That's the true covenant. That's a true Brit where you basically everybody uh, uh, is connected, even though they are very different and they live uh, uh, very, very far, far away. Okay. In fact, of the matter is that that book had readership in Europe. It had readership. Okay, it, it made people feel good. You know, people stopped their uh, reading the, the the Torah studies and paid attention to this book for uh, for a few minutes. And it was clearly written for you know a rabbinic audience. You know, it's it, that's what it seems to me. Okay. Yeah, and as you said, the 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 fact that it was printed twice uh, shows that. So, uh, yeah. it's, you know, as we discussed, it's an interesting book worth reading. Yeah. And this is, you know, if nothing else in his memory, Rabbi Haga, that uh, we don't know what happened to him, and we just have this. This is what we have from him. This is what we know of him. So, another interesting chapter in the Lost Tribes. Yeah. Uh, it's really, you know, worthwhile entry in the series and another chapter in the history of the Lost Tribes and. You know, yeah. and as I call the series, in Jewish consciousness, people interacting with them and or thinking that they are, and you know, with Rabbi Haga and Fink, as we mentioned earlier. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah. Now I have to write another book, you know, because I'm running out of books, you know, to uh, <laughs> to appear in your podcast. <laughs> that's yeah. it. Unless we start the yeah. uh, Chinese history branch, you know, we got some Chinese history in here, but yeah, for the yeah, Jewish yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but my um, uh, the one that I'm working on now, you know, probably going to be another uh, Jewish history book. Um, this time about the Middle East. So we'll see. I'll reach out to you. We, we, in any way, we will keep in touch. You know, and okay. with that message of unity, you know, and and solidarity with all Jews wherever they are, including those who are now in prison. You know, Sovlimi Surim and Machovim. You know, I mean, like poor Haga. You know, Hostages. let's pray this. Yeah, exactly. As we discuss, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Israel. And so, uh, exactly. They should all, uh, Mr. Shem, Mr. Yeah, Shem be, uh, you know, return yeah. to us and uh, be free. So, yes. thank you, Professor Benit, for joining me thank once you again. Thank you for inviting me again. Thank you.